इस ब्लूमबर्ग यू टीवी Images that one encounters every day, religions, faiths, beliefs, coexisting to create a spiritual symphony that defines modern-day India and its people. To understand India, you have to understand what makes it the way it is. How faith is often backed by a deep spiritual base that transcends boundaries. How the past is so closely weaved into the present, and how the teachings of yore are still relevant to the challenges of today. One person making these connections is Vedanta exponent Swami Parthasarthi, who's not only making Vedanta relevant to the young jet setters of today, he's also taking the message of this ancient text to the most aggressive boardrooms across the world, and in doing so, he is giving the biggest management gurus a run for their money. Swami ji, thank you so much for joining me today. Great to have you on this show. You know, I must say that few spiritual leaders would have followed the crisis of modern-day capitalism like you did, and I've heard you say that you predicted the fall of Lehman Brothers. Think there was something on this? See, what I have noticed is not only uh, Lehman Brothers. I found that uh, almost all the airlines in the United States, except Southwest Airlines, they're all going through losses. You know, you know what has happened to GM, what has happened to Chrysler Corporation. So, it's no prediction. It's a fact that uh, the, there's no application of the intellect at all. There's only intelligence, intelligence, and intelligence, which is acquired from educational institutions, from uh, universities, from teachers and textbooks, but uh, they. The persons who are manning that have not been taught to think originally. So the time comes when the intellect is necessary. They are not able to use it because they don't have one. So therefore, it's 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 obvious that people who have got the intelligence start a firm, start a business, but they don't know how to handle it beyond a point. And that's why you find giant corporations closing down. What is intellect as opposed to intelligence? Because one presumes that anybody who spends that kind of time and energy doing something also has developed, you know, a knowledge far beyond what is required. What is the difference between the two? The difference is intelligence is acquired from schools and universities, teachers and textbooks. You acquire knowledge by which you make a living. You go to an engineering school. Acquire the knowledge of engineering. You're making a living. That's about all. But nowhere are you taught how to develop the intellect. Intellect has to be developed by oneself. No teachers and textbooks can help you. So, Amiti, you know this. The difference between intelligence and intellect is also ingrained in the Vedanta school of thought. I mean, in a sense, you've delved deep into the past to. Pull out something which is relevant for now. For a lay person, how would you define intellect? The mind's nature is to slip into the past or the future. It's the nature of the mind. So it is the intellect that can control the mind. Any amount of intelligence cannot control the mind. It is the mind that goes into addictions like drugs or alcohol or any uh, you know greed for money. What happened to the crash? The United States is just greed. So the intellect was not there to control and monitor it. So once the mind gets into that greed, it is finished. Similarly, anger. Similarly, stress. It's the mind that goes to the stress. All these are happening at the mind level, and any amount of intelligence cannot control the mind. It's only the strength of the intellect, the power of the intellect, that can control the mind. I'm going to quiz you about this and ask you how this is used in practical day-to-day uh, -day life. But you know, what I'm also very curious about is that your logic for what happened, as far as the crash of Lehman Brothers, etc., is concerned, was because you said that it was incentive rather than initiative that uh, propelled people. The whole 
uh, capitalist structure which is based on incentive is wrong inherently. I know a lot of people will not agree with me or you know will uh, question that because a lot of people say that it's wealth creation that makes people work. Why do you think there is a dichotomy there? See the whole business community, all business houses are functioning on incentives. Incentives is to draw a person into action by giving them better emoluments, better perks. These are all, it, it's, uh, you know, play, uh, showing a carrot before a donkey, that's about all. Now, this will last for a while. They're actually encouraging self-centeredness, selfishness in a community, in an organization. So, initiative is to work for a higher cost, higher ideal. Now, I would ask the employees of an organization, are you working for the personal benefits, your personal benefits, or for the organization? Are you working for the salary or sales of the company? So sales is a higher ideal. Swamiji, well put, no wonder you, you know, you're so popular in management schools and in forums like the YPO. But my question to you, sir, is, you know, a lot of the success of companies is also equated to the personal ambition of people in it. The whole structure of ESOPs, of getting people part, part of the entire profit motive, etc., is also encouraging the selfishness. Do you think that is flawed in a, in a sense? If you encourage selfishness, it's a flaw because you compete with each other. You, there's no cooperative endeavor. If there's no cooperative endeavor, there's no, co no cooperation flourish. So I, we all have to work for the common cause, which is the company, which is the organization, which is the corporation. You can't get into a corporation and work for yourself. And that's what is happening. Everybody is self-centered. And the, the organization itself, the company itself, encourages that. So they, everybody is looking for incentives. For selfish, they, they're working with selfish motive. So there's no cooperative spirit in an organization. I'm not grumbling. I'm telling you what is happening to the world. All the big uh, uh, corporations are closing down, but they flourish for a while because of incentives. Just as fertilizers for vegetables, supplements and vitamins for bodies, you're giving incentives to fertilize actions. It doesn't work beyond a point. On a different note, when you say this to a group of the youngest and most happening and successful presidents across the world, what, what is their reaction to these thoughts? They're able to see because they are going down. They're able to see where they're failing. See, there is, they're able to see why there is no spirit of service in their company. See, what is happening is if you work self-centeredly for an incentive provided, you are fatigued by the end of the day. You need a scotch maybe now i'm not against scotch they're gonna have it but you get fatigued by the end of the week you need a break for weekend they call it what is this thank god it's friday and then by the end of the year they need a vacation now i worked for 62 years without a break you don't need a break i'm not saying you should not take a break but if they don't have a weekend or vacation they are they, they, they break down. It is because of this idea of incentives given and all the time they're worried of the past or anxious of the future. That tires you. That fatigues you. Not work. Everybody believes work fatigues you. I'm 82 now. I'm still working. I'm going around the world continuously because there's no worry of the past, no anxiety for the future. It is worry and anxiety that fatigues you. So anxiety and fear, Swamiji, that's why I introduced you saying that uh, management gurus should be turning to you because you look within and not at uh, larger you know, theories of management, etc. Well, we head into a short break now, but when we come back, we'll talk about real life daily problems and how perhaps Vedanta has the answer and how Vedanta has been made relevant to today's day and age. Stay tuned. <laughs>
Swamiji, in the last segment you spoke about how um, anxiety and fear, these are the two problems that everybody faces. You've uh, summed it up by saying that Vedanta is actually an art of living and an art of learning. Explain that. See, living is an art, is a technique, is a skill. I don't think anybody understands it as an art or a technique or a skill. By Art, I mean, you'll have to learn and practice it as you would learn violin or golf or bridge. You have to learn how to play the violin. It's not difficult when you, when you start. You may be a better or a lesser player. That, that's about all. But you can learn it. Nobody understands living as an art. The fact that they have lived 20, 30, 40 years they have the feeling that I know how to live. So it has to be taught, learnt and practiced. You know, Swamiji, what I find very fascinating about you is the fact that uh, Vedanta, as a treatise, uh, talks about your connection with Brahman or, or you know, uh, the, the one being. On the other hand, you have said that the same path will also make you discover yourself because yourself and Brahma are the same. And in a sense, it will also make you live a better life where you can do what you're doing, but in a far more focused manner, almost energize your life. I mean, how, how do you balance these two things? Not just your journey to God, but really a professional It's learning. all about action. You understand the Bhagavad Gita was given by Krishna to Arjuna in the battlefield. It's Arjuna who wanted to get away from action. He said, no, you've got to act. And it, it tells you how to act. It is all a formula for action. So, but the general impression is Vedanta is meant as a post-retirement pastime. That's how they view it. But here is a dynamic philosophy. It explains to you the principles of right action to bring success and productivity. So, this is a question wherever I go, they ask. I have addressed all the leading business schools in United States, England, you can, Europe. I have addressed them all. But they asked me the formula of success. The first question I asked them, what is success? I don't think anybody has spelt it out. The deans of the university were sitting there, business schools. Now, success is an effect. An effect belongs to the future. If you, because you asked me, what is success? Success is something which belongs to the future. If success is the effect, what is the cost? Cause is a perfect action. If the action is perfect, you'll be successful. If the action is imperfect, you, there'll be, effect will be failure. So if you want success, your action must be perfect. What is a perfect action? Nobody has analyzed this. Action is perfect when you are following three aspects to it. Concentration, consistency, and cooperation. The next question is, what is concentration? It is the mind that loses concentration. When I'm talking to you, my mind must be on this job of talking to you. When you're listening to me, your mind must be on the job of listening to me. When you're making a meal, your mind must be on that. When you're playing a game, you, you must, mind must be on that job. So whatever you do, your mind must follow the action. But the problem with the mind is it has a natural tendency to slip into the worries of the past, anxiety for the future. And the only thing that can keep the mind in the present is your intellect. So therefore, I insist that you have to develop the intellect. There is no program in any business organization, business management schools to develop the intellect. The fellows who are teaching have no intellect. They are only intelligence. So unless you have a powerful intellect, you can't keep the mind on the job. And that's why the corporations are winding up, because they have no concentration. The mind is slipping into various avenues. And uh, so concentration is the intellect holding the mind on the present job, not allowing it to slip into the past or future. Same thing 
with reference to consistency, the mind must follow a plan of action. And you fixed a goal to reach, and actions must pursue that direction. That is consistency. But again, the mind is distracted to other avenues. When the intellect keeps the mind and the actions in that direction of the goal, you are being consistent. And with concentration and consistency, you can achieve anything. And cooperation, because it has to cooperation, be. Cooperation, as I mentioned earlier, without cooperation, you, a, one person can't achieve in a cooperation. So you need that cooperative endeavor. What you've also always insisted on, in fact, you mentioned it just moments back, is that uh, spiritualism or uh, you know, following a, a philosophy like Vedanta is not something that you do post-retirement. And that's the tendency most people have to do it post-retirement. Uh, do you think more and more youngsters, because you run an academy, you've been running it for decades now, do you think more and more youngsters are actually getting inquisitive, curious about the side of... Not life? more. Every youngster. Really? I have problems with elders constantly. They don't understand because they've got preconceived notions. When I meet an youngster, and you can give me the most indulgent fellow, he could be anything. The moment he hears this, he just sticks to it. There, there are fellows in the United States who heard me for one lecture. He's joined the course. There's a, there's a guy who came uh, past this site and inquired about this. He's from the United States, California. Inquired about it, heard me for two lectures. He's joining. He's coming in, uh, in a few weeks. He joined the academy. I have no problem with youngsters. I have problem with grown-ups. No businessman here or anywhere follows. The Westerners are curious. They're following. But they, they've got preconceived notions. And they all believe they know. The worst that has happened is everybody believes that they know. They don't need to know anything more because they, in their own language, they are successful. So they don't bother. So opening your mind and relearning are these very important facets also in life? Correct. You've got to keep your mind open. You could be very successful if you don't listen to what uh, somebody who knows the subject has to say, then you are in trouble. You must surrender to areas of ignorance. But when you believe that you know everything, there is no surrender, there's no learning. You're stagnant. We head to a short break now, but on the, on the other side, we'll talk about why we're doing this uh, as part of our series, Understanding India. Why is Vedanta so important? Uh, does it say a lot about the way we are as people, as Indians? Stay tuned. <laughs> Swamiji, the more I think uh, about Vedanta, the more I talk to you about it, uh, it seems it transcends religion. Uh, I mean, not once has the word Hindu come into our conversation. So in a sense, is this a philosophy which is pan-religion, so to say? No, it's not trans-religion. It is the kernel of all religions. Religion, any religion, sans philosophy, is a shell. It has no meaning. It's the philosophy that makes religion what it is. It is a guide to human life, but it is the philosophy in the religion. Religious practices are empty shells if you don't understand the philosophy that is backing every religion. Incidentally, Vedanta will explain to you that all religions have the same philosophy. There's no difference. But it is the followers that have messed up the religion. So if we are talking about philosophy, it's talking about our essential being. What is our essential being? 
and how it's related to God. So religion is talking about God. Now how is the philosophy related to God? So what Vedanta philosophy is telling you is it is your own self. Self is God. Do you get frustrated when uh, everybody loses the script, doesn't remember these basic facts that you know you have strife around religion, you have problems, you have somebody saying my God is bigger than your God. Does it frustrate you as a, as a person who has studied How the Vedanta? How can it frustrate a person who has got wisdom? If you don't have wisdom, it will frustrate you. Say, I'll give you a small narration. I got into a lift and there was a nanny who brought a little child, a little cute child, so cute that she was, there's a, must be about two and a half, three years maximum. So it's a long way we are going up, about 35 floors. So I got, the child got into the lift and I was looking in vacant air for a while and you know the, when the lift started eyes went around to meet that child and the child was doing the same thing it was looking here and there and suddenly our eyes met when our eyes met I bent, bent down and said to the child hello baby she looked at me and said I hate you I was she was so cute the way she said it. Now, when you when you have the wisdom, I believe you are grown up. The child is not grown up. I don't know what was the background. She said, "I have to." I kept quiet. So you're asking me, don't you get annoyed? Don't you get upset? Don't you see the absurdity? It's a child. It's a little child in ignorance. He just doesn't know what he's talking. Do you understand, Omid? Yes. So similarly, people talk whatever they want to talk. You understand the children. Children. Swamiji, on that note, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you.